slowdown in request processing can eventually make your service unavailable. Chances are not all requests need to be processed right away. Some of them just need an acknowledgement of receipt. Have you asked yourself, would I benefit from asynchronous processing of requests? If so, how do I make such a change in a live, large-scale, mission-critical system? Hi, my name is Sharma Padilla. I'm going to talk about how we migrated a user-facing system from synchronous request response-based system to an asynchronous one. I want to talk about what motivated us to embark on this journey, what system design changes we made, um, and most interestingly, what were the challenges in this process, and what design choices we had, what trade-offs we made, and I'm going to touch upon the validation process we used and how we rolled it out. So Netflix is available to over 200 million members worldwide. Members who watch TVs, documentaries, uh, TV shows, documentaries, movies on a variety of devices. When they come to Netflix, they are given a variety of choice uh, through our personalized recommendations. Uh, you press play, sit back, and enjoy watching the movie. While the movie plays during the playback, we collect a lot of data for both operational and analytical use cases. Some of this data drives our product features like viewing history and continue watching, which lets our members stop a movie in between and come back to it to continue watching from that point on, on any other device later. The data also feeds personalization and recommendations engines and the core business analytics. Today, I'm gonna to talk about how our experience migrating one of the product features, viewing history, which lets members see their past viewing activity and optionally hide it. Now we're talking about um, making available global materialized views in a very low latency, near real-time fashion. So what motivated us to embark on this journey? So let's look at our existing system at the time. At a high level, we have Netflix client on devices such as mobile phones, computers, laptops, TVs, that is sending data during playback into the Netflix cloud. First, it reaches the gateway service. From there, it goes to Playback API. Playback API manages the life cycle of the playback sessions. In addition, it sends the playback data into the request processor layer. Within request processor, among other things, it is storing both short-term and long-term viewing data um, into persistence, which is Cassandra for us, and also into a caching layer, which is EV cache, which lets us do really quick lookups. Most of the time, this system is working absolutely fine. Once in a rare while, it is possible that an individual request being processed is slowed down because of a network blip, or maybe one of the Cassandra nodes slowed down for us a brief time. When that happens, since it is a synchronous processing, the request processing uh, thread in the request processor layer has to wait. And then this in turn slows down the upstream playback API service, which in turn slows down the gateway service itself. Now beyond a few retry strategies within the cloud, the slowdown can hit the Netflix client that's running on the member device. Sometimes this is referred to as the back pressure. And back pressure can manifest itself as unavailability in your system and can build up a, a queue of items that the client may have to retry. Some of this data is very critical to what we do, and we want to avoid um, any data loss if the clients were to run out of the queue, for example. So before I go into what changes we made, you'll recognize that if we were to abstract things out, we are following a few steps that are 
um, part of a generic data processing pipeline. We ingest, enrich, process, store, and serve. Uh, the, there's business analytics, data warehouse, and, and there's also personalization recommendation engines into which we serve this data. So the rest of the talk is going to focus on these layers from ingest to store. Short changes to be made. So between the playback API service and the request processor, we introduced a durable queue. So now when the request comes in, it's put into the durable queue and immediately acknowledged. There is no need to wait for that request to be processed. Well, it turns out Apache Kafka fits this use case pretty well. Kafka presents a log abstraction to which the producers, like Playback API, can append to. And then multiple consumers can then read from the Kafka logs. Uh, at, at their own pace using offsets, for example. So this sounds simple. We introduced Apache Kafka in between two of our processing layers, and can we call it done? Well, not quite. We are operating at a scale at an appro approximate order of magnitude of 1 million events per second. Now, at that scale, you start to hit upon a few challenges in asynchronous processing. So let's talk about that. So I'm going to touch upon data loss, processing latencies, out of order, and duplicate records, consumer platform choice. We still have to manage intermittent processing failures. And then let's touch upon cross-region aspects as well. So when we think about data loss, there's two aspects that I want to talk about. One is, well, if the Kafka cluster itself were to be unavailable, of course, you might lose data. And one simple way to address that would be to add an additional standby cluster. So if the primary cluster were to be unavailable due to unforeseen reasons, then the publisher, Playback API here, could then publish into the standby cluster. The consumer the request processor in this case can connect to both Kafka clusters and therefore not miss any data. Now, obviously the trade-off here is additional cost. And for a certain kind of data, this makes sense. Does all data require this? Fortunately not. We categorize our data for playback into two, and the critical data um, gets this treatment with an additional cost with a standby cluster. The other less critical data gets a normal single Kafka cluster. Now, Kafka itself is highly available. Now, within Kafka, it employs multiple strategies to improve availability. So in general, it works fine. Another aspect of data loss is what's happening at publish time. So let's dive into it a little bit. So Playback API gets a request. It is publishing a record into Kafka. So there's a choice here. Kafka it has multiple partitions to increase scalability, right? And each partition is served by an ensemble of servers called brokers. One of them is elected as the leader. So when you are writing into a partition or publishing into a partition, you are dealing with the leader broker. Now, there's a choice to say, do I wait for the leader to acknowledge that the item has actually been persisted into durable storage? Or do I also wait for the follower brokers to acknowledge that they have written into persistence as well. If you're dealing with critical data, it would make sense that, yes, you do want to wait for acknowledgment for all three of them. Turns out, at a large scale, this has implications um, beyond just the cost of waiting for multiple writes. If you were to lose um, the leader broker, well, how do you handle that? We're dealing with a cloud-native, large-scale distributed system, and failure scan, and will happen. And in fact, it did happen for us when we deployed this within a couple of months. So if the leader broker were to become unavailable, or, or actually any broker were to be unavailable, and if you're waiting for acknowledgement from all of them, obviously your processing is going to slow down. And that slowdown, again, causes back pressure and unavailability, which we're trying to avoid. If we were to 
get acknowledgement just from one, which is the leader broker, there's an interesting case. What if you were to then lose the leader broker later? Now, leader election will come up with a different leader. However, if the item that was acknowledged by the leader was not completely replicated into the other brokers, then doing such a re-election of the leader, sometimes referred to as the unclean broker leader election, could make you lose data, which is what we're trying to avoid, right? So how did we um, handle the situation? And again, there's a trade-off here to make. So we have a producer library that is a wrapper on top of the Kafka producer client. And there's two optimizations that are relevant here. One is that because we use non-key partitions, the um, library is able to write to a partition. And if that partition were to be unavailable because the broker is unavailable, then it automatically writes to a different partition because it's non-key partitioning strategy for us. Also, if their partition is on an under-replicated set of brokers, so that is the leader broker has more items than the follower leaders, and the replication has not caught up completely, then our library picks a different partition that is more well-replicated. So with these strategies, we eventually ended up choosing to write in asynchronous mode, where the publisher writes it into an in-memory queue and asynchronously publishes into Kafka. Now, this helps scale performance, et cetera. Uh, but we were interested in making sure we have an upper bound on what is the worst case data loss we would incur if multiple errors are all happening at the same time. And we were happy with the upper bound we were able to configure based on the in-memory queue size um, and, and the um, strategy of um, uh, avoiding under-replicated partitions, et cetera. And we monitor this data durability, so to speak, and we consistently get four or five nines from it, which is acceptable for us. If your application must uh, not lose any items of data, then you may want to pick acknowledgement from all brokers before you call that item processed, and that would suit well for you. OK, so processing latencies um, are interesting in the sense that if you were to have a good idea on the peak traffic you're going to get, chances are you can figure out the number of consumer processing nodes you need in your system. You configure it once. And since you can handle the peak, it's all good. It's simple. That's a good situation to be in. For us, the traffic uh, changes across the day across the day of the week as well. And we see a 5x change from peak to trough <clears throat> of our traffic. Because of such a big volume change, we wanted to be more efficient with our resources. And we chose to auto scale. And specifically, we add or remove a certain number of consumer processing nodes based on the traffic. So there's a trade-off to make there as well. Let's look at that. Whenever you change the number of consumers, there is a rebalance that happens within Kafka. So all of the partitions are rebalanced across the new number of consumers. So the trade-off here is resource efficiency versus paying the price of a rebalance. Rebalance can affect you in different ways. If your processing is stateful, then you would have to do something a little bit complex, as in you get a signal for rebalance, uh, you pause processing, you take any in-memory state, and you checkpoint that along with the Kafka offset until which you have processed. You let the rebalance happen. After the rebalance, you reload the checkpointed data, and then you start processing from the checkpointed offset. If your processing is a little simpler, or if you are storing state in an external fashion, then it is possible for you to let the rebalance happen and just continue normally. What's going to happen here is that since you may have had items that were in process when the rebalance starts, 
and have not been acknowledged into Kafka, those items would show up on another processing node because that node now gets the partition after the rebalance. So in the worst case, you are going to reprocess some number of items. And if your processing is item potent, it's not a problem. Or if you have other ways of dealing with duplicates, which I will talk about later, then this might actually turn out well as well for you. So the next question is, how do I know when and by how much to auto scale? Recall that we've said we would need to increase the number of processing nodes because otherwise the items would sit longer in Kafka and that's referred to as the lag. How much lag are we seeing before an item is processed from the queue? So one would think lag is a good metric to trigger out a scale. And it makes sense. You could scale up based on that. The problem is you cannot easily scale down by this metric. When the lag is zero, how do we know if we were to scale down by one processing node, 10, 50? Um, you, you might flip flop by removing some nodes and then watch uh, observing lag. You add nodes, zero lag, remove nodes. In practice, a lot of people use a proxy instead. CPU utilization is a good proxy. For us, records per second turns out uh, a, a good trigger for auto scaling. Um, in steady state, you are able to tell how many records are, are processed per second. And then based on that, we can add uh, more nodes or less. Uh, we have an autoscaler, and here's a result of a 24-hour period that I'm showing here, um, where our workers, which are the consumers, um, they aggressively scale up by the autoscaler. So we want to avoid rebalances during scale up because we are already seeing a lot of data. We want to quickly scale up and then let it slowly scale down later. A few rebalances in a day is okay. Um, basically, a coarse pain autoscaling. So out of order and duplicate records are going to happen in a distributed system. Um, well, I talked about a few cases before on how they might happen. If you're familiar with stream processing, windowing is a technique a lot of people use. Um, here you are collecting events based on a time window, or you could do sessionization based on <clears throat> specifics of your application. Recall that this is for a playback session, a video playback session, which has a specific start and end events. And therefore, we could collect all events for a session within those boundaries. It's possible we might miss a stop event if a member were to be watching on a laptop, for example, and just close the laptop, which will not give the Netflix client a chance to transmit the stop event, in which case we time out. So either way, we have sessions for for multiple events of that session. And based on certain attributes within the data, uh, we could order them and also deduplicate them. For example, you could have a monot monotonically increasing ID or a timestamp from the client within those events, and that could help you. For writes, we are able to deduplicate them by uh, using the server timestamp, that is the time when the event reaches our server. Um, since events are transmitted in order by the client, we can use that for modified time when writing, and therefore we do not see a problem with it. So it turns out there are multiple uh, platforms we could use for consuming and processing requests. Well, that's a luxury, right? So we have three. Mantis is a stream processing system that Netflix open sourced a few years ago. Apache Flink is a popular stream processing system. And then there's the classic microservice, which could use a um, consumer client and then just process the data from Kafka. So we started out with the question of, hey, which platform is the best one for me to use? And realized that's not the right question. I should be asking which processing platforms benefit which use cases. And it turns out, based on the use case, you could use each of these three. They all have pros and cons. If you're doing complex stream processing, Mantis and Apache Flink are a very good fit. 
Apache Flink also has a built-in support for stateful stream processing where each node can store its local state, for example, for sessionization. Microservices are very interesting, at least for us, because Netflix engineers have uh, an excellent support for the microservices ecosystem all the way from generating or starting with a clean code base all the way to CI CD pipelines and monitoring. So we use all three for different use cases. Okay, so now that we've addressed challenges, well, we still have to deal with uh, intermittent failures of processing. If you were to get an item and got an intermittent failure, well, beyond maybe a simple retry, we wouldn't want to block the entire queue behind because of one item. Sometimes people refer to that as head of line blocking. So instead, we put it aside, process the rest of the queue, and then come back to it later. Now, a characteristic we would like for such a system is that there should be a finite time elapsing before we try it again. There is no need to try it immediately. So that's what we mean by a delay queue here in this picture. There's a variety of ways you can implement this. Maybe you can write it into another Kafka topic and then build another processor that builds in a delay. Um, it turns out for us, it's very easy to achieve this using Amazon SQS since we already operate on EC2. We use the simple queue service to put an item, and then the queue has a feature to optionally specify a future time when it should be made visible. So that works easy. Cross region if, um, aspects are important in the sense that since Netflix operates in multiple regions and it's a large distributed system, it is possible a region may become unavailable once in a while. We routinely practice for this and multiple times a year we take a region down just to make sure that we exercise our muscle of cross-region um, traffic forwarding so well at first thought it would make sense that uh, uh, an item that was meant to be for another region could be just remotely published into a kafka topic using a tunnel across the regions that normally would work, except when you do encounter a real outage of that region, uh, that remote publish is not going to work. So a simple but subtle change we made is that we always want to publish locally. So we publish to another Kafka topic and asynchronously have a region router send it to the other side. So this way, all events of a single playback session can be processed together. Now that we have challenges figured out, trade-offs made, um, how did we test and roll it out? Shadow testing is popular. Chances are you may already be using such strategies in your environment. For us, this consisted of having playback API dual write into the existing synchronous system, as well as into Apache Kafka, from which the asynchronous process processor was consuming. And then we had a validator process that would validate that the in-flight requests are identical. The next step was to make sure that it's not just the in-flight request processing that was identical, but also the stored artifacts for which we created a shadow Cassandra cluster. Now here, you're trading off costs for higher confidence. And if you have an environment where it is um, relatively easy to get additional resources for a short period of time, which is certainly possible in a cloud environment like ours, then it gives you the additional benefit of confidence before rolling it out. And we rolled out using um, user ID to give us a consistent slice of the traffic that we migrate into the new system, um, starting with 1%, 5%, all the way to 100%. So then that gave us a really smooth migration without impact to upstream or downstream systems. So this is a quick look at uh, where we are and where we're going. So the items in blue here, uh, the playback API, the Kafka, of course, and the viewing history processor, bookmark processor are in production. 
And we have the rest of the system that deal with other attributes. There's an attributes processor and session logs, which would be interesting because the size of the data is very large, uh, way larger than what you would normally write into Kafka. So we have some new challenges to solve there. So with that, um, I would summarize that I shared with you how asynchronous processing improved the availability and data quality for us. I showed you how we reasoned about the design choices and what trade-offs made sense for our environment, and showed you how shadow testing and incremental rollout gave us confident and smooth rollout. With this, I invite you to think about how this applies to your environment, what other trade-offs you may make for a similar journey, and I invite you to connect and tell me, share with me your experiences. Thank you. Herma, thank you for um, sharing your experience and giving this talk. I think it was um, very helpful to the audience, and I see a lot of questions uh, they've already raised. Um, so some of it is, you know, a narrative and question answer, and I sort of want to sort of hard when it's in a in a window. But um, do you want to tackle maybe the first thread in this? Um, let's talk about, okay, there was a secondary cluster question, right? I think it's about the scale and availability and, and those sorts of things. Do you want to address those questions? Sure. Um, yeah. So the motivation for having a standby cluster is to uh, avoid data loss in case Kafka cluster itself becomes unavailable. And the Kafka itself is highly available in general. It employs several strategies within the system for high availability. Um, so, but since we're dealing with the critical uh, playback session data, we wanted the ability to have that cluster available. I again, we make this available for certain critical data, but not necessarily all of the data. And the cluster is always available um, as a warm standby. And the publisher then uh, upon detecting, or if we determine that the primary cluster is going to be unavailable for some time, then it switches writing, publishing into the alternate cluster. And they are similarly sized, so there's no difference there. And the consumers are, are um, have clients attached to both of these clusters and therefore can continue processing. So um, in practice, have you seen, ha has your service done a failover beyond just your testing it? Like... Yeah, early on, uh, we had a case where there was um, misconfiguration on the Kafka cluster. Human error always happens, right? Um, and this caused um, a publish to be stuck because uh, the one of the, for example, for a particular partition, there are three brokers in an ensemble to serve traffic. And the publish mode was set to act all. And in that case, if one of them, one of the brokers were unavailable, then it would stay there for a while. And it caused an unexpected outage where we were able to switch quickly and then later realize there was a misconfiguration in how the broker was set up. Oh, was it the publisher side or the broker? The uh, One of the brokers, uh, which is a cloud instance, became unavailable. So publisher Oh, had so you had ACK all and maybe RF was not equal the the in sync replica ISR, that's usually the problem, right? It's not equal to RF minus one. Is that the general problem? So you're doing a rolling upgrade of your broker. One went down and you stopped being able to publish. Yeah, this is not doing a, an upgrade. This was just a, a, an instance becoming unavailable and oh, okay. it should happen in the cloud. Yeah. Okay, got it. Yeah. This, sometimes this is the, it wasn't the ISR equals RF minus one problem. C correct. That is, no, that's okay. a different. Okay, so in this time, how long does it take for your publisher to um, detect the error and failover? Yeah, so this is something that we we, we tune um, since we learned from it. So in the beginning, it was set to, uh, it, it basically caused uh, a, an even worse case of back pressure because the publisher slowed down waiting for acknowledgements that it could not get. Um, so what the way we have made it work right now and this touches upon another question of data loss that, that I'll, I'll end up answering as well, which is we have uh, first switched to ACK1 
Act One will basically let us uh, acknowledge or, or, or respond back as soon as we get an acknowledgement from the leader broker. This presents a problem that if the replication is not in sync, then you could potentially lose data if the leader broker were to go away. Um, but then we can avoid that in other ways. I'll touch upon that later. So, and then we also um, move to uh, an asynchronous mode of publishing. Now, this is totally interesting in a sense that for a case where you do not want to lose data, it is not recommended. The asynchronous mode lets us put the data into the memory buffer and have an asynchronous thread published into Kafka. The main advantage here is to get scalability and performance with a trade-off of a small amount of data loss. And for certain applications, uh, we can easily get an upper bound on this data loss and therefore are able to make the trade-off and be satisfied with it. So for example, our data durability uh, requirements are four to five nines, and we can mm -hmm. easily get that with uh, sizing the memory buffer and ensuring that a flush happens rather quickly and things like that. Okay, uh, you were talking about um, durability and there's a question about what was the overall improvement in availability for your system end to end? How did you measure so, it? Yeah, so I think I touched upon towards the end of the slide. So we are in the process of migrating multiple components. Um, so the true availability will be visible when all components have migrated. So there are some components that are still in the synchronous mode. However, for the components that did, we did migrate, we are able to see a quite a bit of less processing needed um, in the sense that we can have fewer consumer nodes mm -hmm. um, and then absorb any intermittent spike in traffic with a small latency without incurring too much latency and auto scaling these instances. Uh, so we've, we've seen uh, higher higher um, uh, improved utilization of resources and yeah, reduced footprint in the cloud. Okay, uh, so why would that happen? Just because Kafka is faster, so therefore the readers and writers don't need to be scaled up as much? Yeah, it's so, a good question. So it, it, in the synchronous system, we need to be better prepared for spikes mm -hmm. um, because otherwise there would be back pressure going back all the way to the clients and possibly data loss if the retries are, are, are exhausted. So we need to run the system a little larger uh, to be prepared for spikes. Whereas in Kafka case, since Kafka is already sized for a certain amount of data that we were going to have, the consumers may experience a little lag when there is um, spike in traffic. But as long as the lag is acceptable and you put auto scaling on these, then you can run fewer consumer instances. Got it. What's your auto scaling signal? Uh, that's that's a good point. So originally, it would seem that uh, a lag would be a good metric to scale on because that is what we are trying to avoid. But the problem with that is you cannot scale down easily. Can't scale so, down. That's right. There's there's no signal for scaling down exactly. or scaling in. Yeah. So um, there's proxies for such uh, a trigger that people end up using. CPU utilization is a good one. For us, it made sense to do RPS records per second. In steady state, we are able to estimate what is the records per second per consumer instance we're able to handle. And based on that, put a target tracking or a scaling policy. Um, this is more a, a, a bit like a PID controller style where it is trying to match the um, amount of uh, lag that is in the system or amount of RPS that is happening and then add or remove instances. So it's very aggressive in scale up um, and, and then slowly scales down after. Interesting, okay. How, how do you, have you generally had to test this? How, how did you test this effectiveness? Like one issue with this is, you know, the proactive or predictive auto scaling, right? Where upstream, there's a bottleneck, you don't get anything, you scale in, but I, I guess you scale in very carefully and slowly. And then all of a sudden there's a burst that you're not ready for. Yeah, this is something that we had tested because we're also using an auto scaling strategy that's built into Mantis stream processing system that I mentioned. Um, 
And, and there are similar strategies available on EC2 Cloud as well. So what we uh, were doing in the beginning, for example, when we did uh, a region outage uh, or cluster, Kafka cluster outage exercise was to pre-scale the um, cluster for, for leading, uh, pre-scale the consumer cluster to, to prepare to lead from, from the other um, cluster, which would have a big spike in traffic. But what we found was that the autoscaler is able to aggressively scale up uh, within an acceptable lag of time. Otherwise, um, we would have to manually scale up. Predictive autoscaling does not seem to be required in this use case for us. Okay. Um, another question someone asked is, do you change the number of partitions over time? automatically or do you do it manually okay now that's a good question because uh right now for this application we're using non-keyed partitions um so it makes it simpler to add the partitions so since we started this project we've not added partitions um i think we we try to estimate the overall size of the traffic and have large number of partitions so it is less likely for us to add there are other applications at netflix that have added partitions um, and Kafka handles that pretty well. Um, yeah. Um, but yeah, there's no auto increase in partitions uh, currently. Okay. You don't have increase partitions. Okay. Um, and typically, again, that's the. It's easy to auto increase. It's harder to determine when to decrease. Right. Because it can cause all sorts of bottlenecks. And another question that was asked is. Um, you know, this is about the rebalance you touched on. When you scale consumers, this causes a rebalance with Kafka to redistribute the traffic between the new amount of consumers. This is not a trivial thing to do in Kafka. So, um, how does how does it work? How how do you make this thing work? Oh yeah, so this is something that we had to spend some time figuring out. What do we want to do? Um, at one extreme of the spectrum, so to speak, we have the ability to get a notification when a rebalance is going to happen. And then in the consumer cluster, do a checkpoint of the state and of the Kafka offsets, and then let the rebalance happen. And upon start, you reload the saved checkpoint state and the offsets and continue from there. Um, this is a coordination that's built into our stream processing system. That's one way to do it. Um, there is another way to think about it. Um, if, if you're processing, is um, less stateful. That is, you 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 are you are able to handle duplicates by either um, a better strategy in how you process and save those data, or if you have item potent behavior in your operations, then you could let the rebalance happen. And in the worst case, you are going to get um, a few duplicates processed, and that is. There is an upper bound to that, right? So if you let, take the number of consumers, um, multiply that by the number of records that it uh, grabs from Kafka each time, in the worst case, that's the number of records you would uh, process duplicate. So I think it depends on the application. For stateful processing, you should probably do checkpoint and restore. And for less stateful or, 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 or item important processing, you could just let the, the duplicates happen. Um, so then it's the case of overhead when you change the number of instances where you're doing the duplicate processing. Okay, so I have another question. Uh, this is from me, actually. Um, I have noticed something. Uh, I, I, you know, similarly, I do this auto scaling with Kafka, right? And I noticed a funny thing that happens once in a while where um, the, the nodes increase, but the partitions don't rebalance. I've actually noticed that. And uh, the way... I then I you know have to do some manual guesswork and I find one pod, you know Kubernetes pod is still got most of the traffic, and is a bottleneck, and then I have to kill that pod. And of course this is a, again another thing someone should write, that uh, you know an auto detect and kill, to force the rebalance, because just because there are more nodes available with consumers, Kafka doesn't always rebalance to them. Like the typical uh, trigger for rebalance for Kafka is a timeout, right? Uh, there's a certain max pull interval. If it doesn't hear back from you on a manual act in by default, it's five minutes or something, or maybe mm -hmm. three minutes.
it's some large number. I think it's five minutes, but default. Five minutes, yes. And it'll rebalance weight. But if it's humming along and you add more consumer threads, it won't interrupt what it's doing to balance it out, right? Even if the consumer CPU is really high. If the consumer CPU is so high that it pegs the CPU to cause a five minute timeout to happen, the rebalance will be triggered. But then at that point, you've killed your SLA if, if you're SLA sensitive, right? Waiting for the five minute or three minute timeout. Um, so I've noticed once, it doesn't happen often, like sometimes it doesn't preemptively auto balance. Sometimes it does, most of the time, 99% of the time it does. 1% of the time it doesn't and it's an operations uh, like all hands on deck thing where we have to identify the pod and kill it. What, what, have you ever run into this? No, that's an interesting point you bring up. I've not, I've not handled that case myself. I'll have to check with the uh, team that handles the Kafka cluster itself more closely. Um, but there may be another aspect to what you're saying is that uh, there is a, a little bit of a math in the sense that the number of consumer instances and the number of partitions and brokers, when you divide them, um, obviously, unless you have a, a, a perfect multiples, uh, you're not going to divide the partitions across exactly. And even if you add one more consumer instance, it might not get any traffic because it doesn't necessarily get divided. Uh, equally or, or or in a healthy way. So I think there's that aspect of how quickly you, you can see rebalance happening in a good way when you add more broker, in, uh, more consumer instances. Um, and for that reason, it, it works a little bit better when the number of consumers is much smaller than the number of partitions. So then you have a better ability to divide the traffic across them. But the case you mentioned, I have not allowed to go back and check with the team. Oh, okay, wonderful. Okay. Um, have you so another way to ask this question is have you ever noticed hot spots like where there's um I mean the way I, I noticed this is uh it's scaled out, but performance is not in, improved. And then I noticed it's because it didn't rebalance. Have you ever seen that where auto scaling didn't result in a drop in lag? Yeah, the, the hot spots happen especially when you're using key partition. In this application I talked about, we are not using key partition. So we basically do a round robin um, or spread across. So in fact, our publisher has a thin wrapper around the publisher client from Kafka. And what it does is uh, it looks at uh, things like the load or uh, replication status on each of the brokers or each of the partitions and then yeah. prefers to spread across. So, by the way, I think we're out of time. These are, you know, great questions, and there are still a lot of questions people have that haven't been answered. Uh, please join us in the Zoom room, and uh, Sharma will be there to answer your questions along with myself. Thank you, Sharma, thank you. for your excellent presentation. Thank you, sir. And thank you, everyone, for your great questions. See you at the Zoom room.